Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Special breaking news episode, activists occupy site of proposed lithium mine in Nevada, featuring Will Falk. The encampment was just announced on Monday, January 18th, and I spoke with him by phone that day. The long and the short of the story is that the Bureau of Land Management just gave the green light to a company called Lithium Americas to establish a massive operation in Thacker Pass. The company has already built roads, drilled boreholes, and dug a two-acre test pit. They plan to build large tailing ponds for toxic mine waste, build a sulfuric acid processing plant, import more than 170 semi-loads of sulfur per day, pump 850 million gallons of water annually, and dig an open pit of more than two square miles into the mountainside. At risk from this habitat-destroying industrial activity are a number of animal and plant species, including the threatened greater sage-grouse, the Lahontan cutthroat trout, a critically imperiled endemic snail species known as the Kings River Perg, Old Growth Big Sagebrush, and Crosby's Buckwheat, to name just a few. Will Falk is a biophilic essayist, poet, and a lawyer. His work has been published by Earth Island Journal, The Dark Mountain Project, Counterpunch, and the San Diego Free Press, among others. He is also author of the book How Dams Fall. His most recent project was an ongoing multimedia project called The Ohio River Speaks. Will and I talked about the geology of the area and its ancient natural history, the details of what Lithium Americas plans to do in the area, the effects of human overconsumption on wildlife habitat, how government policy instituted card culture, the fast-tracking of this project by the Trump administration, the bipartisan consensus on using public lands for industrial energy development, the endangerment of first foods, a vital cultural resource, and what the campaign needs and how to follow and support them. Please share this episode on social media. If you're listening on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. To support this podcast financially, you can make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash colibri or become a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com slash colibri. The song you're hearing is The Warm Green Mist of Afternoon by Dan Hanrahan, who's been a guest on the podcast too. See show notes for how to hear more of his music. And now, here's my conversation with Will Falk, who was on the ground at Thacker Pass, Nevada. Will, I appreciate uh, you taking some time to talk to me today about what's going on out there. You're in the middle of Nevada. I am. I am in uh, a place called Thacker Pass, Nevada. I think the nearest town would be Oravada, Nevada. Um, and we are a couple mo- a couple hours from Reno, uh, but up in a, a beautiful uh, mountain pass that really personifies the Great Basin up here. Right. I looked on a map trying to find where Thacker Pass was, and there was something on Google Maps that was called Thacker Pass, and it was near Highway 95. That is correct, yes. Okay, cool. And that there was a town nearby also uh, on the Oregon border called McDermott. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so you're right there on the Oregon border. It's very close. Yeah, yeah. It is, um, it is part of uh, what's called the McDermott caldera uh which is um an old there used to be an active volcano here some 17 million years ago or about uh, and that uh active volcano formed uh the mcdermott caldera which um 
stretches into Oregon, straddles the border between Oregon and Nevada. And that volcano uh, kind of created the perfect place for this uh, inland lake about 16 million years ago. Uh, and that lake is responsible for collecting uh, a lot of lithium in this mountain pass, which is why we are up here. Right, right. Because that whole landscape of the Great Basin and uh, further south in Nevada down into the Mojave, a lot of people describe that as made up of basins and ranges. And the basins, a lot of them are old lake beds from a long time ago. And I've spent a lot of time in that area. And it's quite obvious when you're in that area that water was once part of it. The whole landscape does have the appearance of having been shaped by water, even though there's none there now. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, you know, one of the uh, sort of dominant ecotypes here is is sagebrush steppe, which, um, you know, over the years, some writers have called it the sagebrush sea, and it always seems to remind me of, of those lakes, and it looks like um, sometimes when you look out across the land, it, it seems like those lakes were frozen, and then the sagebrush grew over it. Um, but yeah, it's it's really dry and there's not very much water, even though the um, the effects of water are very, very strong, as you said. Right. And then up on the ranges around there, do you probably have, uh, I'm guessing, uh, juniper or maybe pinion juniper woodland? Yeah. Um, in the in the specific past, uh, we're in there's not um, either it was cleared a long time ago or the specific conditions um, weren't weren't exactly right for for pinion juniper um, pinion pine trees and juniper trees up here um, but yeah if uh, the valley over has them um, the mountains I'm looking down to the south and, and the foothills uh, of the mountains I'm looking at uh, have them um, and and yeah, that's another really common ecotype that um, that is in the Great Basin. Right, and this is a this area is pretty remote, obviously. And I looked on the map, and it looks as if there there's definitely um, some ag some agriculture in some of the nearby valleys. I saw what looked like center pivot irrigation, you know, the the big circular plots that you can see from the satellites there. But you know, like a lot of those kinds of areas out there, they've really been relatively untouched if there hasn't been mining uh, happening there previously. Right. The um, I would say the major uh, human influence over Thacker Pass uh, has been uh, cattle grazing, uh, ranching. Um, and that's that's pretty apparent every everywhere you go there's there's lots of cow shit um there's a couple big uh, uh plastic you know they look like um little plastic swimming pools but the big water reservoirs that are put out for um cattle to to drink from um and there's also uh Thacker Pass has some old growth sage, um, but unfortunately there's also been some places where they've clearly changed the sagebrush out, um, which uh, for our listeners is a process where um, usually BLM or the Forest Service uh, takes two vehicles, sometimes two um, you know, tractor trawlers and, and stretch an old um, chain behind them, usually an old U.S. Navy battle chain actually. Uh, and they drive really slowly or um, with the with the chain stretched across the, the two vehicles and that chain just rips up everything. Um, and there's a couple pretty obvious uh, flaws that have been chained um, even just a few steps from where we're camping here. Um, and so when you look out across many places in the Great Basin, but especially in Thacker Pass, you can kind of see this checkerboard of of sage and then places where the sage has been destroyed and then sage um and the thinking behind um clearing that that sage is that it it makes room for grasses to grow and that the cows will will fill the area and eat the grass um i think that that's some of that's rather dubious results but um 
that that is kind of the major uh, evidence of human activity up here is is the is the cows everywhere and um, um, the big areas that have been chained. Right, right, okay. But so this latest thing uh, that that they want to do out there with Lithium Americas, it'd be a much harsher impact than all of that. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, the, the reason that, that uh, me and my friend Max Wilbert are up here is there is a uh, big lithium mine uh, proposed uh, for Thacker Pass. Um, it's a mine that would cost uh, an estimated $1.3 billion to get uh, up and running. Um, it's it's a mine that uh, would require ripping up about 5,000 acres of, of Thacker Pass um, to get to lithium. That'll be primarily used for lithium-ion batteries, which um, are in turn primarily used in electric car batteries. Um, it's it's a uh, horribly water intensive process um th- this mine will will require using about 2600 acre feet of water annually which comes out to 850 million gallons uh this is the driest place in the United States uh, so it will require um transporting water over great distances and all the destruction that that infrastructure will require to get the water here, uh, they from their environmental impact statement, they Lithium Americas is estimating that uh, they'll have to burn about 11,300 gallons of diesel fuel per day to operate this this mine. One of the things that the Great Basin is really known for is the is the crisp, clean air. Um, you know, the breeze is always moving here. You're really close to the sky. Uh, there's not a lot of other human activity, so the you know the air is is pretty nice. <laughs> um, so you know it'd be really horrific to fill this this air with um, that much uh, diesel exhaust. Uh, another um, another really interesting thing um, that will be required for this mine is um, they need sulfuric acid to leach the lithium from from the clay stone that they will rip up from Thacker Pass. And uh, they're going to get that sulfuric acid by trucking in hundreds of tons of sulfuric waste from distant oil refineries. And then they will set up um, a few miles down from the pass, they're going to set up a a sulfuric acid uh, production center um, where they'll, you know, They'll be producing thousands of tons of sulfuric acid to to leach that lithium out of the stone. Um, it's a really, at least in my mind, uh, in, inefficient process. It, to produce one ton of lithium, uh, they'll have to uh, strip mine between 110 and 500 tons of earth um, to to get that lithium out. Uh, so it's it's going to be a massive operation. I think the whole, um, the whole mine will, will be about, um, a mile long and two miles wide. Um, that covers about 5,000 acres. Uh, it is going to be an open pit strip mine. So, um, you know, a lot of people think of the open pit mines in Appalachia, the big, um, gashes that are cut into the hills there, uh, well, that that process will will be happening here at Packer Pass if if the mine's not stopped. Um, not only um, will sort of all that physical destruction happen, but um, this place is is um, really important habitat to an iconic um, Western Amer- American Western species, the greater sage grouse. Uh, over time, the sage grouse have have been hammered. They're down 97, maybe 99 percent of their historic levels. And Thacker Pass actually represents the best remaining sage grouse habitat in all of Nevada. Um, it's been estimated that um, the the Lone Willow Population Management Unit, which is 
which Thacker Pass is a part of and, and is a, um, a sage grouse management unit that BLM uses to um, as much as 8% of the entire global population of greater sage grouse. Um, so it would be a disaster for, for sage grouse. Um, there are, um, despite this being the high desert, there are some streams um, running off the, the hills here, and there is a threatened species of cutthroat trout, the Lahontan um, cutthroat trout, um, that uh, exists downstream from Thacker Pass. So it's it's likely that any sort of um, chemicals, any sort of runoff, any sort of pollution that happens at Thacker Pass is going to flow down and affect those trout. Um, there's a, a very critically imperiled endemic snail species um, that lives in the springs that uh, sit in the mountains above Thacker Pass. Um, they only, they're all, they're called the King River Pyrg. Um, and they, I guess, I've learned only exist in about 13 of these springs up here. Um, and they, it's possible that the mine would, would threaten their, their whole existence and, and push them to extinction. Um, we, we found out uh, yesterday from an ecologist that's really familiar with the area that this is um, apparently a really good winter hunting ground for golden eagles. Um, and destroying Thacker Pass would, of course, destroy the, the golden eagle's prey, the, the rodents, um, you know, the mice and the rats and, and other creatures that uh, live here in Thacker Pass, um, which, would, which could, you know, really threaten golden eagles. Uh, so, um, yeah, and I, I guess the other thing is the, the old growth sage that's here. I I w was not familiar with um, this concept of old growth sage, which kind of shows my own ignorance before I spent some time up here. And, um, you know, there's some sagebrush that grows to four and five feet high. Um, in the past, um, you know, these the, the sagebrush have been here for years. Um, they're they're an iconic um, plant species in in the Great Basin, um, and you know some of them are so tall that you can even you can even lay down um, in their shade like you would would a tree. So um, all of this is at stake. All of this is threatened um, by Lithium America's uh, Thacker Pass Lithium Mine. Um, um, one of the, the biggest things that um, I've been trying to communicate is is that we really need to keep in perspective what what is happening here. A lot of environmentalists might be confused about why we would want to impede um, the technologies like electric car batteries that are supposed to be, um, you know, that are supposed to result in lower greenhouse gas emissions um, that are supposed to be, you know, somehow more green or more, um, you know, environmentally friendly than fossil fuel cars. Um, but we would be destroying, if, if this mine happened, we would be destroying the habitat of, of countless creatures um, for, for basically a luxury that human beings don't actually need. Um, and, and, and what I'm saying is, uh, Humans can survive and thrive without automobiles um, for the vast majority of human history. Um, the, the humans um, traveled, humans transported themselves on their feet, um, maybe in boats um, blown by the wind and on waterways. Um, a few thousand years ago, it's true, some humans did domesticate animals and we traveled by horse or by oxen. Um, or, or other animals, um, but it's really been a very small fraction of human history that uh, we've had cars the last 100 years or so. And to destroy uh, such a beautiful place and to destroy the habitat um, that all of the beings that I talked about earlier 
require for their lives, um, it, it, in, in my mind, is simply um, immoral and um, wrong. <laughs> and it's something that I would be opposed to for, for whatever the reason. I don't think that it's okay to destroy a mountain for coal. I don't think it's okay to destroy a mountain for solar panels or wind turbines. And I don't think it's okay to destroy a mountain to access lithium for electric car batteries. Right, right. I think that this is something that people really ha- don't understand so much is the habitat question here that you just explained so eloquently. Because over the last couple of decades, there's been more and more of a focus on carbon emissions as being sort of the main environmental problem that we're facing. In the past, there was more talk about other issues that we have about just plain old pollution, for example, and how that destroys waterways, how that gets in the ocean, how that just, you know, gets in the soil, etc. And in the past, there's also been a lot of criticism of cars, not just about their emissions, but about what they do to the land, to habitat, and to human communities as well. But as we've focused um, more and more on the carbon end of it, people have tended to forget these other bad aspects of car technology and of technology in general, and are just like, oh, well, the battery part solves the problem of carbon. So that's all we have to do. And as if cars were not bad for any other reason. And I think that also, especially people who live in in cities and don't have the chance to get out to the wild places, out to nature, they don't realize what's happening out there. They don't realize that the choices that are made and that the lifestyle is dependent on the destruction of habitat. And I really appreciate the point that you make that what we're talking about here with this mine, you know, and with all these projects, but with this place in particular here is a choice of leaving a habitat for the creatures who are already there or providing for yet another way to grow our economy and grow our consumption. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, I think that Sacker Pass um it represents it, it represents all of the things that you said and it so the, the really horrible thing is is Thacker Pass is is just one more small place that that has been destroyed for um things like like car infrastructure um you know every time you know a highway is built you're destroying habitat and you're um, you're creating um, barriers for certain species that fragment their habitat, which is which is a primary driver of of ex- extinction. Um, you know, it's it's we can't really talk about this without acknowledging that that we're in the middle of of the sixth mass extinction event, um, the first one that's been caused by humans, um, and it. it it is it is climate change is certainly part of that, but the destruction of habitat might be um, an even worse part of that. The fragmentation of habitat um, is another part of that. And um, again, to, to keep things in perspective, um, there there have been really credible studies come out over the last five years that are that are saying that um, since 1970, we've lost um, over 60% of vertebrate, spree- vertebrate um, um, individuals. So all of the, the vertebrates that existed on Earth in 1970, well, there's over 60% less of them alive today through things like direct destruction of habitat. Um, it, it, there doesn't need to be very many decades that pass if that trend continues before uh, we just don't have very many vertebrates left at all. Um, and and it, is, it is because of big industrial projects like this. Um, it's because of things like car culture that that habitat is being destroyed and that humans are driving species to extinction. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I'm going to keep harping on this point. We're doing it for something that we don't actually need to live happy and healthy lives. In fact, 
cars may be a, a major part of why we don't live happy and healthy lives today when you, you consider the the exercise that doesn't happen because we can drive everywhere and the, the air quality that is harmed because of all the um, emissions in the air. Um, there's something has really happened in the last few decades to to this culture where many humans have been convinced that um, we must have on our cars and we, we must be able to travel by that mode. Um, and it's a really, uh, it's a really odd and horrible trick that's been played on people. Um, um, so, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not okay to, to destroy everyone else just so humans can, um, travel really quickly at really high speeds in these little metal boxes to, to places that they want to go. Right. Right. And I would just point out, you know, quickly, uh, as well that, the primacy of the car and the dependence on the car and the seeming necessity of the car at this point is not based merely on uh, consumer choices by individuals, but on policy. It was uh, government policy in the United States after World War II to create the suburbs. So there were Absolutely. loans that would be uh, the 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 Prior to World War II, if you wanted to purchase a house, you needed to come up with 50% to put down. Then you only had three to five years to pay it off. Well, they wanted to provide housing, make it easier for all the GIs coming back to, to get housing. So the government, I believe under Roosevelt, created a, a program where they would basically guarantee the loans. So they'd say to the banks, okay, we're going to cover this if they default. So what that meant was that the banks could then do a deal where now you only need to come up with 10 or 15 or 20% and put it down and you have 20 or 30 years to pay it back. So that made houses affordable for people. But that wasn't just that. It. it was that it made new houses affordable for people and specifically new houses in the suburbs. And so there was that. And then there was the federal government putting down 90% of the cost of the interstate highway program, which was uh, made it possible for people to drive out to these suburbs and to live there. And so this was not an accident that this happened this way. And being that it was policy that drove this destructive change, it also then, I think we need to have policy that's going to turn this around the other way. So this is the other thing to push for, because of course, you know, if you give up your, your car for a bike and you're lucky enough to live in a, in a city where you can do that and have that be practical, that's great, but that's only chipping away at things in the smallest possible way. And what we really need to be doing with our dwindling resources at this point, in my opinion, is retooling our society so that we aren't dependent on cars anymore and we can cut back our, our consumption because there's so many people right now who they really are trapped in car culture in a, in a very real way, I would say, you know? Absolutely. That, and that's a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. One of the, one of the things that I heard in your point or, you know, the connection that I made is um, you're, you're totally right. It's not um, as, as with so many technologies, um, I think that, now that that car culture is ubiquitous and everyone has their cars, it seems like there this was sort of an inevitable step in in human progress, so to speak. Um, but what you just described was no, it was actually a very um, concerted and intentional effort um, to to create this kind of culture to to make people dependent on cars in that way. Um, and, and whenever you can show that something is not inevitable or natural or, or somehow, you know, preordained by the forces that be, then, um, you know, then that means that we as individuals and more importantly, we as culture and society can, can choose to go a different direction, um, and, and choose to, to create a different kind of, um, life way, um, that, that doesn't include cars. And another point that you made that I think is, that I, is really important and that I want to be really sensitive to is that it it is true that, um, car culture, the suburbs, um, the, the, uh, urbanification, so to speak of, of, of the world 
has made it so that many people live in places where it is really difficult to grow enough food to um, to support yourself, and it's even more difficult to grow enough food to make sure that your whole community is fed. And so that requires um, importing food from other places, and a lot of that importing takes place with with things like uh, semi trucks and through the through the highway systems that crisscross the planet. Um, and I want to be sensitive to that because that means that um, you know this this car culture is very much dependent on finite resources, whether we're talking about um, fossil fuels or whether we're talking about electric car batteries, there's only so much lithium on earth. Um, um, the, the, the production of, of cars, um, still requires massive amounts of fossil fuels to create them. So as fossil fuels run out and as the rare earth metals, um, are, are over exploited and they run out, um, there are going to be huge communities, huge populations of humans that are really stranded in places where where they probably won't be able to um, feed themselves. And um, to me, the answer isn't to procrastinate and push that problem back and back and, you know, make our kids and grandkids deal with that problem. Um, say the, the the most just and the most responsible thing that we can do right now is is face that problem and start to think about how we can um, how we can avoid the the worst um, the worst catastrophes that that all entails and you know it it, it includes so many things it, it does include new policies that um, help you know massive populations of humans become less reliant on cars um, um, it it requires you know f- for me personally I think that uh, it means that we have to start thinking about how we can you know reduce human populations when I say things like that people often accuse me of being a eugenicist but I'm <laughs> that's a lot of steps to to skip I'm talking about people um, choosing to have less or no kids. I'm talking about um, empowering women to have full uh, reproductive freedom, full um, control over their over their bodies, and full agency over whether they have kids. Um, and and in the end, that will help us avoid um, massive uh, populations of starving humans. And at the same time, it will help um, the, the devastated uh, wildlife populations um, recover and, and, and perhaps move back into some of their um, old habitat and, and hopefully lead us to a, a world that's healing and, and um, getting better <laughs> over time. Right. Basically, what it boils down to is that we need to reduce our footprint and currently we are not reducing our footprint and there's not really any talk about reducing our footprint at this point either. Like just the idea of conserving, cutting back, shrinking the lifestyle is just that hasn't been a, a part of the discussion. And in the part of the world that we live in here, where our consumption is so much higher per capita than other parts of the world, we really need to be talking about it first here. You know, not how can we make yeah. our not not basically not how can we fuel our cars in a different way, but how can we do with fewer? That is absolutely what we need to be talking about first. I, but I want to get back to Thacker Pass again. So you're so this is happening on public land, right? This is on Bureau of Land Management land. It is. It is. It is public land that, um, at least in the sort of American government, the traditional American rhetoric. This is, you know, our land. I shy away from that as a as a white settler um, calling this land mine. Um, however, uh, uh, American tax dollars, our tax dollars, go towards um, protecting and and. <laughs> 
well, you know, whatever BLM does that they say they're protecting the land. But that is the, the theory. This is public land. This is supposed to be all of American citizens land um, and it's going to be destroyed. Right. So there's there's an aspect of it here where there's a public giveaway to a private corporation for them to make profits and we'll be losing on that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, in, 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 in a very direct way, um, the, the American government, which um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but uh, the BLM on Friday, um, so this is Monday, January 18th, on Friday, January 15th, uh, BLM, um, record, they, they issued what's called the final record of decision, uh, which is, is, which is basically the last, uh, federal hurdle that, um, any kind of project like this has to clear to gain their permits. So, um, in doing so, uh, like you've said, BLM, um, is gifting this, this land to a, a corporation, um, and, you know, it's sort of like a direct land subsidy to the corporation. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a perfect example of how government and corporations work together to, um, impoverish all of our futures. Right. And you would use the phrase fast tracked by the Trump administration in some of your materials about this. Yes, the Trump administration really uh, forced through um, a few mining um, mining permits, or, or you know, gave uh, gave approval to a few pending mine um, mining uh, projects. Uh, most of them, or some of them, were probably ones that Biden would have been opposed to. Um, however. Uh, I think that uh, the incoming Joe Biden um, um, presidency and his version of the Green New Deal and his vision for um, expanding alternative energies uh, makes it unlikely that the Biden administration would oppose the Thacker Pass project. Um, so, yes, Trump definitely forced this through and made this happen faster um, but it's important for, for people to understand that um, the Biden administration would would by almost certainly would would support destroying Tucker Pass as well. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to point that out because there were so many instances where the Trump administration was pushing through things um you know, often, you know, fast tracked, as you just said, and, and often these were not getting very much attention, that there was more attention from the press, you know, um, you know, to, to his tweets or to the Russiagate, you know, conspiracy theory that was being put out there all the time, you know, to the, you know, to the point where we weren't really hearing, I, I felt like we weren't hearing enough about all the bad things the Trump administration was doing this whole time. And then, as you said about, you know, Biden, I've noticed that one of the things he says he wants to do is is make the United States carbon neutral, or maybe I can't really remember exactly what his phrase was by 2050. And I look at that and I'm like, oh, okay, well, given what the Obama administration was doing with public lands and specifically with the deserts and doing its own fast tracking there of huge solar and wind projects. I'm like, okay, so does carbon neutral by 2050, is that really just going to have the result of tearing up a bunch more public lands, mostly in the West, many of which, you know, haven't been touched until now. I mean, this is a constant sort of frustration to me as well, I guess is all I'm saying there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the, one a huge point that you're making, you know, in in the media especially, you know, they will spend all day, like you said, analyzing Trump's tweets and um, analyzing Trump's various conspiracy theories that he floats out there. But when the very real, he's he's also, you know, he was also um, destroying the land, the most the most real of all things, and. Um, of course, the media doesn't focus on that as much. And one of the results is that 
so many, I think, good-hearted and well-meaning Americans. They get they spend all their time worrying about Trump's tweets and and um, you know people occupying the Capitol and that kind of thing, and they're not paying attention to the fact that um, water is, it continues to be poisoned, um, the pollution of air is intensifying. Uh, we're losing more and more forests, all those kinds of things, the things that we really actually depend on. Um, and I think a symptom of that is, or or something that comes from that then is then people, um, they don't understand how things like solar farms um, destroy the land or, or windmills destroy the land. And if we're, if we're removed from the, the land and the reality of the land, then we can be tricked by some of the things Biden says and that Obama did, um, you know, we can be tricked into thinking something like um, alternative energies, which, which destroy the land in a different way, are somehow going to save the planet. Right, right. And I think that, you know, for, for people who want to know more about these kinds of things, I, I always send people to Basin and Range Watch. There's some activists who are based out of Beatty, Nevada, who really keep an eye on all of these projects, and they get into all of them and the details of them. They're constantly posting pictures of what's happening, and they're explaining what's going on out there. And one of the things that they advocate for is is that if large solar projects are going to go in, that they can go in in brown fields, they can go in parking lots, that they should be building them in areas that are already, I mean, if that's going to happen, that it should happen in areas that are already disturbed, not these areas that are relatively undisturbed. But with the Thacker Pass, where you're at there now, you said that the record of decision went down on Friday. So that means that the project is basically a go at this point in that the whole process has happened with taking comments and all that? I think um, there... I think it's it's virtually a go. I think they're still waiting on a few um, state of Nevada water permits specifically, um, but the state of Nevada has been um, <laughs> very willing to to mine. <laughs> Um, you know, Nevada has always been a place that's been really heavily mined, and that doesn't seem to be changing. Um, so yeah, the the uh, the, the in, best information we have is that um, Lithium America hopes to break ground by the end of the first quarter, so um, by April 1st. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I imagine that they're expecting those permits to, to happen without a problem. Um, um, it seems like, you know, following sort of the um, uh, investment news. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of news in the investment world about lithium Americas and Packer pass, um, because this mine would, um, supply 25% of the world's lithium supply. Um, investors are investing like crazy. Um, but that, that is, is another thing that they're pushing really hard right now to get the capital that they need to, to make sure that the mine happens. Um, and it, 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 it seems like it could be very imminent, you know, within the next few months, they, they could be digging here. Right. So that's why you got out there right away and set up. Yep. Um, it's Max Wilbur and I are out here right now. Uh, we invite, um, people to come. People ask, you know, what do you need? And, and the most honest answer is we need other people. We need bodies up here. Um, we, we also want to be clear that, you know, if you can't come and stay for forever, like me and Max are kind of planning on, um, if you, but if you come and you can spend a few days, um, um, you know, we, we'd love to talk to people, educate people on, on the harms of this mine, on the harms of so-called green energy, um, in general. Um, and, and there's always kind of little tasks to do around our little camp. Um, and, uh, yeah, it would be, it would be nice to, to have some other people here, um, also to just kind of bolster our own hearts. We imagine there's a few, some ranchers in the area are opposed to the project. Some ranchers in the area are not opposed to the project. Um, 
obviously BLM and giving the permit um, is not going to be totally stoked that we're up here. Um, so, you know, at a certain point, someone is probably going to try and force us off this place. Um, and, you know, that'll be harder for them to do if there's more people here. Right. Definitely. Okay. And so people who want to follow what you're doing, the um, updates as, as this news is happening, and uh, where should they go? We have a website uh, that is simply protectfackerpass.org. Okay. Facker is spelled T T H A C K E R, um, and we'll be um, posting, you know, developments and news uh, as we go from that website. We have a Facebook page also called Protect Facker Pass. You can like that page to to get the stories in your news feed. Um, I think I think those are the two the two main sources for information right now. Okay, that sounds great. Cool. Well, I'll put those links in, in the show notes so that people can go check those out. And I really appreciate being able to. Oh, there was one thing I wanted to throw in uh, uh, as well. Uh, my my friend here on the land, Nikki Hill. I believe you probably recognize her name. She's been involved with wild tending circles the last few years and her teacher for a while was Phoenicia Madrano who you might have heard of and when I told her about what was going on here today and she looked up the location she was like oh yeah that pass that goes between Oregon and Nevada there near McDermott that was a pass that Phoenicia knew well and that was a place that if you were out there on horseback doing the planting and the tending and the harvesting of the wild foods of the traditional first foods. That's a traditional way to go back and forth between those areas there. So that's another thing in that area that's an important, that's a, a I guess you would call that a, a cultural aspect, you know, there besides the other ones that you've mentioned. Absolutely. And that's a really good point. And thank you very much, Nikki, for saying that I, uh, or, or reminding us of that. That's a really important thing to keep in mind. So cool. So thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Well, I really appreciate it. And I'm you know, wishing you the best there and I'll be keeping up on, on what you're doing. Cool. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you for your tremendous writing and work in the world. It's, it's amazing. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri. K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.